1967 or 1968, Joan W. was five or six years old. She can't recall the exact date, but she did remember that she saw something extraordinary in her room as a child, something she likened to the Tooth Fairy. This case was sent to Stephen Wagner for his Your True Tales of the ParanormalAbout.com website. According to Joan, she had just gotten the tooth out the night before and had placed it under her pillow in hopes that the Tooth Fairy would come in the night and take it. The next morning, before dawn, her mother woke her. She had to take her brother to seminary school, so Joan had to get up and get ready. When she checked, Joan noticed that the tooth was still there. She shrugged it off, crawled out of bed, and started to get her things together to leave. After heading downstairs for something, Joan began making her way back upstairs to her room. Standing on the stairs, she looked through the railing into her bedroom. She was startled to see something strange in her room. It was a flitting blue light near the foot of her bed. She watched it for a few seconds as it moved about. Joan was certain that what she was looking at was the Tooth Fairy. She ran downstairs and told her mother, who insisted that it was merely a reflection. Further, she asked Joan, if it was the Tooth Fairy, why was it at the foot of the bed, not up near the pillow? I remember that her explanations did not describe what I had seen. It was not reflected. It was a discreet blue light moving quickly. If I had wanted to tell a story, it would have been a figure and near the pillow. This was not Tinkerbell, nor was I a child to tell stories, but I had no fear and it was strange that I went up those stairs in the dark, since I was terribly afraid of the dark at that age. Joan noted that later she had found a coin under her pillow, although she was certain that it was her mother who had placed it there as per her less than surprise reaction at being told. Ultimately, Joan looks upon this sighting with fondness. It was a happy memory, except in that I was not believed by anybody. Uh, so it doesn't really sound like a tooth fairy uh, encounter. Like It doesn't sound like a fairy or anything like that. But it does sound like she had maybe walked in on a some type of... Like a lot of abduction stories involve blue lights and rooms filling up with blue lights. So that kind of got me thinking of maybe she had walked in on a, a possible abduction event. Like maybe that she wasn't there and she was supposed to be. I don't know. It's a really strange story. I don't know. When most people think of the Easter Bunny, they imagine a cute, cuddly rabbit delivering eggs and gifts to happy children. However, there is at least one encounter in paranormal literature which bucks that happy image. For Mike B, his sighting of an entity that he likened to the Easter Bunny would leave him terrified. This bizarre case can also be found in the files of Stephen Wagner's ParanormalAbout.com. Mike B claims that when he was seven, he decided to stay up all night in hopes of seeing the Easter Bunny. At the time, he was staying with his grandmother, along with his sister, who was nine. The grandmother had decided to share her bed with the two kids, if only to keep her eye on them. Everybody was asleep except Mike. Mike recalls that he was wide awake, cold, and desperately trying to get some of the blanket that his sister was hogging. So I was trying to fight with my sleeping sister, and all of a sudden I heard hopping downstairs. I was confused. I didn't hear the door open. Then I heard something hop up the stairs. I started to pinch myself. Yes, I was awake and cold, and I started to sweat, a bit overwhelmed. The hopping noise was coming up the stairs. Mike closed his eyes, fearing that the intruder might know he was awake. He, or rather it, entered the room. Even though Mike's eyes were closed, he could feel the creature grab the blanket and pull it over him. Soon the creature moved to the other side of the room, and Mike cautiously decided to take a look. I couldn't believe it. He hopped to the other side of the bed toward the window and just stood there. I got a quick peek. A huge rabbit, human size, with big ears pointed up. I was shocked. It couldn't be real. He was just standing there looking at my grandma. He just stood there. Unable to sleep, Mike stayed up, keeping his eye on the strange creature. Eventually the sun rose and the creature seemed to vanish, almost like it faded into the light. I was speechless. I got up and looked around. Nothing was there. Had Mike encountered a human-sized Easter Bunny, or was this some type of sleep paralysis hypnagogic hallucination? While there are accounts of giant human-sized rabbits in paranormal literature, 
including one spotter in an area known for UFO and Bigfoot activity, they typically don't show up inside people's homes. Most giant rabbit encounters occur in forest settings, often by shocked hunters and hikers. The fact that this entity seemed to be inside the house leads me to wonder if it was some type of hallucination and nothing more. It was October 1965. Francisco Estrada Acosta had gone out on a small game hunting expedition near a local mining area in San Luis Potosi in Mexico. He spent the afternoon there. While bending down to collect rocks for his slingshot, he began to get the strange sense that something was standing beside him. Given that he was alone out there, he found this odd. Standing up, he was startled to see a tall figure with a large oval-shaped head, huge reddish phosphorescent eyes, and a large toad-like mouth. The strange humanoid extended a flipper-like hand to Acosta. He touched one of Acosta's hands on his palm. According to Acosta, the creature felt cold and scaly, like that of a reptile or an amphibian. Upon realizing that this was not a prank or somebody in a mask, Acosta was suddenly gripped with terror. He instantly backed away and then took off running away from the creature. Glancing back, he noticed that the creature had membrane, wing-like protrusions on its back and was apparently preparing to leave also. This encounter was detailed in the book Contacto Mexico. In 2007, a man who gathered with his family in Ohio for Thanksgiving would experience something truly bizarre. He claims that he had spent the early part of the day helping his mother in the kitchen preparing dinner. Everybody was laughing and having fun. While making pumpkin pies, my mother needed a break from the heat of the kitchen and went into the living room to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I stayed in the kitchen and continued to work. The man claims that while making the pies, he realized that he needed to go to the pantry to get some ingredients. The pantry is located down a short hallway connecting the kitchen with the back of the house. I grabbed the items I needed and headed back to the kitchen. I was almost back to the kitchen when I remembered that I forgot to grab something and quickly pivoted around to head back to the pantry. To my shock, there was a man standing near the area I just was. It must have been two or three seconds, even though it felt like forever, and then he was gone. I have never seen this man before, but I can remember he was wearing overalls and a hat. The most disturbing thing for me was it seemed as though he reacted to me. It was like he was either shocked that I saw him, or he was shocked to see me. Not wanting to disrupt the fun, the man decided not to tell anyone of his sighting. It wasn't until months later he decided to tell his mother, who insisted that in the 35 years she lived in the house, she never saw anything strange. I know what I saw. I know he was there. My question is why? Who is he? Why did I see him? In my 28 years of living and now visiting my childhood home, I have so many great memories, but the two to three seconds on that Thanksgiving day seems to be burned into my mind more than anything else I have experienced in that house. A man named Morris claims that he saw something terrifying in his youth. He claims the incident happened in 1996 when he was 12 and to this day he has no idea what he saw. It is far and away the most terrifying deer man encounter I have ever heard of. Morez was in the Boy Scouts. It was their annual week-long summer camping trip to the Adirondack Mountains of northern New York State. It was a good six hour drive north of the city of New York and they were literally in the middle of nowhere with the nearest town about 20 minutes away. Morez recalls that on the night of the trip after lights out he and his two friends Bobby and Mike were restless and they decided to sneak out to investigate a trail they had found earlier in the week that led up into the mountain. They had begun to follow it a couple days earlier but they had to go on an activity and they aborted their plans. They were still very curious to see where it led. With flashlights in hand they set out on the path. It was a very dark night with no moon and the woods on both sides of the path were thick and dark. The path went on for quite a while and seemed to get steeper and steeper as it wove higher into the forest. Bobby began to feel spooked and suggested they turn back, but Juarez and Mike felt drawn to keep going higher up into the hills. They continued on for what they determined was a very long time, when finally, up ahead, they saw a warm orange glow, a campfire. 
As they drew closer, they realized the fire was massive. It was a raging bonfire. In the middle of a circular clearing in the forest, they saw someone standing next to the huge bonfire, but he was still too far away to see it clearly. They crept closer, sneaking up behind a large oak tree. To their horror, they saw very clearly not who, but what it was. There, in the middle of the clearing, stood what they could only describe as a deer man. Juarez recalled that it was huge, at least ten feet tall, probably taller. To Juarez, this creature appeared to be towering over the fire. It was so big. It looked like a typical white-tailed deer buck, except it stood on its two hind legs like a human. Upon its head was the biggest rack Juarez had ever seen. Its forelegs were not hooved like a deer's, however. They were hands like a person's. It held a twisted wooden staff in one hand and a skull in the other. Needless to say, they were speechless as they stared slack-jawed from behind a tree. Just when they thought it couldn't get any stranger, it did. The strange creature actually began to sing and dance. It sang horrible words I couldn't understand and didn't want to. I remember its voice was high-pitched, cackly, and I was instantly reminded of an impossibly old woman. It gyrated and shimmied in a fashion I found so horrifying I felt my heart sink. It leaped completely over the fire several times prancing about like a deer would. I remember looking at my friends. I remember like it was yesterday and the terror in their eyes, despite the fact that they had not made any noise. The creature stopped and whipped its head in the direction where the boys were hiding. It pointed its staff at them and let out the most blood-curdling scream. Terrified, the three turned and charged off down the path and down the mountain, too scared to stop or look back. They ran all the way to the lodge and stormed through the door. In between crying, the boys managed to tell a concerned scout leader about what they saw. While he doubted them, he did put a call out to a forest ranger stationed nearby, asking him to go out and investigate a strange man hanging around the lodge. The boys watched as the forest ranger's jeep drove up the path into the hills. About 15 minutes later, the ranger returned. He entered the cabin, informing them that there was no one up there. He told them that he had driven all the way to the clearing, but there was no one there, not even a fire. The boys pleaded with him that they saw what they saw, but the ranger insisted there was nothing there. The next morning, after they had all packed and were waiting to go, the scout leader agreed to drive up there and check it out, if only to put the boys' minds at ease. To his surprise, they found the clearing and a large fire pit that was still smoldering. They also discovered a number of deer tracks around the pit that seemed to weave around in impossible patterns. The scout leader and the boys couldn't get out of there fast enough. In the intervening years, Wars claims he went back to the area a number of times, but has not encountered anything. He has attempted to reconcile in his mind that what he saw was nothing more than a man in a deer pelt. That's what I've tried to tell myself on so many sleepless nights, but I know it couldn't have been. If you had seen how tall it was, how it danced, it was utterly inhuman. Sadly, 13 years later, Mike would die of a drug overdose. Um... It sounds like there's if the rain like the, if they found this stuff at the day the next day, then that means the ranger must have seen it, and either he, either he lied to them and, and encountered this thing and was just too spooked to say anything and maybe he didn't want to scare the kids, or, uh, maybe he I don't know I, maybe he wasn't there, maybe the fire wasn't there maybe I don't know that's just weird. Uh, maybe the, the, like I said, maybe the, the ranger saw everything and just was like, I don't want to deal with this and decided not to uh, scare the kids and said nothing. But, um, if that's going on, you'd think that he would want to, uh, make sure the kids were safe and get, you know, out of there. But I don't know. It's just a weird story. Maybe they, maybe they know about the guy. Maybe this, uh, this, uh, sighting of this thing is common and the, some of the rangers kind of know about it. I don't know. I, I've actually heard deer, uh, deer men's stories before, deer people stories, where people saw them, uh, a deer a deer man dancing around a fire. I've actually heard that before. I have actually read a, a case like that. I think Lon Strickler uh, had it in his file. So it's not unheard of, but it's, it's definitely strange.